Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to the Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. Thank you, Andrea, and hello, everyone. Savage here with you for yet another episode of the Stephen Savage Show, the official podcast of the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema and the Scotland International Festival of Cinema, podcasting as usual from Cranium Wheel Studios at Chateau Esteban in the beautiful village of Idlewild, California, just a couple hours east of Los Angeles, but a world away at just under 6,000 feet overlooking the great Coachella Valley. And uh, we're less than a week away from the kickoff of Idlewild 2023, and it's it's been snowing like crazy here in Idlewild. I was in L.A. for a week, and when I returned to the mountains, it felt as though I'd landed in the Yukon or somewhere else just as white and cold um, anywhere but uh, sunny Southern California. But the forecast for the next week, uh, the festival week in Idlewild, calls for beautiful snow-capped mountains, but no snow and um Warm temperatures for sure, much warmer than now. It's going to be nice. But for those of you attending Idlewild this year, uh, bring lots of warm clothes because it will be chilly. So today's episode is the first of what I believe will be four episodes leading up to the film festival, featuring conversations with some of the IIFC Spotlight Directors for 2023. Uh, We have Terry Ross, who will be talking about her IIFC selected featurette, Chateau in the Luaire. And uh, direct and Ke- director Kellen Gibbs is uh, going to be on to tell us about his first feature film project entitled Tomorrow. And lastly, we have on director Jennifer Rao, who will be telling, telling us about her amazing short film entitled Pretty Doesn't Hurt. So without further ado, let's get into this IIFC Spotlight Directors episode of The Stephen Savage Show. Enjoy. On the line with me now is the multi-award winning director of a film we're very much looking forward to screening at Idlewild this year. The film is entitled Chateau in the Loire, and if I've butchered that, please forgive me. And the director is Terry Ross. Terry, how are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm thrilled to be here, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. And and, and uh, I was just in France. I spent a lot of time there in the in years past, but my French is terrible, so I hope I didn't butcher the title of your film too much. Uh, my, my, my French is not good either. It sounded, <laughs> sounded great to me. Well, how, how <laughs> dare you entitle your film something that neither one of us can pronounce. So you're calling in from Julian uh, here in Idlewild. It's snowing, but it's supposed to, the sun's supposed to come out tomorrow, and the film festival week is going uh, to be pretty sunny, but I, ma- I imagine you guys are getting some pretty crazy weather there as well. We, we are, but we're pretty much on the same schedule because it's supposed to uh, stop tonight mm-hmm. and then be sunny for the rest of the week. So I'm excited to see the sun again and oh, uh, yeah. and to see beautiful Idlewild in the sun with the snow, but not snowing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I like the snow peak <laughs> mountains, but I also like wearing a short sleeve shirt once in a while. <laughs> so uh, before we dive into uh, the film, uh, tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be a filmmaker in the first place. This, this is going to be sort of an audio director spotlight, I can see. <laughs> so just, uh, yeah, just give us some of your, your background. Sure. Well, I really came to film in a kind of roundabout way. Um, I started in this crazy business as a dance and musical comedy Mm -hmm. um and then uh ended up you know getting into acting and in the bay area i was an actor in the bay area for about 15 years Mm -hmm. and then um kind of wanted to broaden my horizons i i ended up going to uc davis and getting an mfa in directing and um and then getting hired to teach here in san diego at some universities at san diego state in the theater department and um university of University of San Diego, and then also for the MFA program for the Old Globe. Um, and while I was here, my my agent from San Francisco was also my agent in San Diego, and he said, "We need somebody to teach film acting classes here, and you should do it." Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I did, and um, really fell in love with the process, and then. Um, 
ended up doing some 48 hour films and you know the bug just bit me and it's been filmmaking ever since it has a way of doing that doesn't it it's addictive it certainly does every time i finish a feature film i say i'm never doing that again never and then then we get into the edit and it's like can't wait for the next one (laughs) it's so true it's so true you just need that pause after to kind of regroup directing commercials is so easy you're in in and out in two three days and then you know you're not wearing as many hats but yeah making a film it is like a drug. We're, <laughs> we are addicts, that's for sure. Um, it is. Tell us, about, um, tell us about the film Chateau in the Loire and uh, how that came about for you. The, the locations are amazing, by the way. Oh, thank you. So uh, a couple of years ago, I, I, I was thinking I would love to combine my two greatest loves, which are travel and film, mm-hmm. and... Um, Kind of started looking into the feasibility of that, uh, into you know, into locations, into um, properties that would take us, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, because with with each of these films, it's a trilogy. The first one we filmed in um, uh, in, in Umbria, and um, we need to have a, a, a property that's big enough to house the cast and the crew. Right. Um. So anyway, um, uh, initially. I had I had been to a place in uh, in Tuscany that I thought would work for us, um, but that fell through. And then I found the castle in Umbria, and I'm I'm really glad that we did. So, um, uh, it had always kind of been my thought that I'd be going to uh, Italy and France. I wasn't sure about the third the third location, which is the film that's now um, in post production, the a Villa in the Algarve. Mm-hmm. Um, and that came about because I watched a movie. And I was like, where is this place? It's so beautiful. And it was Sintra. And I went, well, we're going to go to Portugal. (laughs) (laughs) Portugal happened. So, um, but anyway, so the, the French film was complicated because, uh, it, it was supposed to happen in, um, in, I think it's 20, 20, 21, like anyway, or 2020 and the pandemic had hit. Mm -hmm. So we had everything lined up the location and everything and um and then of course we couldn't go um and then we had to uh, renew it for the following year which luckily we were able to do and even uh in the in the next year when we went there were still so many restrictions uh it was right. really difficult we had to get all these special uh passports from france in order for us to travel over and mm-hmm. um and luckily in in all these countries we've had a kind of a liaison that i've been able to meet and um we had a wonderful uh, woman, Summer, who helped with all of that because it, it we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, it I, when I first started, you know, trying to get caterers and equipment and stuff, France is very interesting. Nobody responded to me. Right. I mean, nobody. Right. So luckily, Summer was there. She speaks the language, and she was able to, uh, you know, to negotiate and, and get folks to help us. So she was invaluable. Yeah, it's so important to have boots on the ground when you're shooting overseas. Well, even in other states, you know, but I mean, overseas, I just shot in London for um, oh, wow. five or six days. And if without those people on the ground who can kind of guide you around, it's it's almost impossible to do. But yeah, it's good good that you found somebody over there. Um, how much do you find that locations dictate the script, speaking of that? Because I've had, I've actually had... Uh, you know, gone by some location that I just fell in love with and ended up writing a script when I found out I could get that location. <laughs> you know, I'd walk up to somebody and say, hey, I want, I'd like to shoot a movie here, even before I had a script, you know, and find out that they were sort of welcoming to a film uh, shoot at some place and then write a script around that. <laughs> have you, have, how much of that have you done? I, I am travels? so with you. I'm yeah. so with you. I don't write the script till we get the location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll keep that a secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's on the podcast, so it's not much of a secret. But <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I know how inspiring access to a to a locale can set your creativity in motion. But oh, um, it totally, it totally does because, um, you know, I started researching after we got the chateau. You mm-hmm. know, um, uh, the the history of the chateaus and the 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 history that's in the film with Louis the Fourteenth owning that chateau. That's not really true, but <laughs> but. Um, it led me to a lot of research, um, uh, you know, about chateaus and 
you know, when Louis the Fourteenth had them and his mistresses and stuff, and that mm-hmm. really, you know, influenced some of that story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it. The overall look of the film is just beautiful. So, congrats on that. Who was oh, the who thank was your you. who was your cinematographer on that? John Freeman. He was also our cinematographer in uh, in Italy, and he's been nominated for a for a yes. Juan Anchi, I believe. Yeah, good. That's yeah. great. Yeah, I remember. I don't get to watch many of the films, but our team will call me and say, "Hey, you need to watch this movie," just so they want to make me aware of it. And yours was one of the first oh. one, one of the first ones this year. <laughs> then I said, "Okay, I'll check it out," and I'm really oh. glad I did. I wish I had time to watch every movie, but with a hundred films and my regular work, <laughs> it takes it's kind of hard to do. But where where has the film played before? What festivals have you been in? We. Um uh, actually, it'll be a premiere with That's you guys. That's what I thought. Okay, I've got notes here, so I'm looking at it. And it says that. So this is, but I was, is this a U.S. premiere or a world premiere? It's a world premiere. Ah, that's great. Yeah, see, I was confused because I thought it's probably premiered already in Europe, but but I guess that's just the vibe of the film, you know. I figured you'd have you'd have run it around Europe before you came here, but that's great. That's awesome. I'm uh, I'm going to make sure that people know that that this is a world premiere, and, and it's, uh, we're really happy that you brought it here. Um, well, I love your festival so much, and um, one of I think the third uh, 48 I ever did, The Last Resort, mm-hmm. um, won a couple of awards in 2015 at your festival. Oh, and nice. Stephen, it was so encouraging to me as a filmmaker. So I'm deeply grateful to you guys. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're that's our thing is just for showcasing um, newer talent with vision. You know what I mean? It's like... You know, we don't play the big glitzy um, uh, Hollywood studio films. We're just, it's not our big interest. Our interest is to is to showcase um, filmmakers who haven't had that quite, that shot yet on the, that rung of the ladder quite yet to where they're making, you know, $30 million films. So I, I like the fact that we're kind of like the, we're kind of like the uh, minor leagues for Hollywood, and a lot of films come in are completely like yours, just completely uh, uh, pro league uh, kind of movie making. So we appreciate mm-hmm. that. What's the future of Chateau in the Loire? What, are, what are, when are we going to be able to uh, see it? Are you hoping for uh, distribution right away, or what are you doing? Well, because it's part of a trilogy, uh, right? Gotcha. So yeah. um, villain Neil Garb. So. Um, my, I'm actually thinking right now of um, sort of using the films as a springboard to create a series. Uh huh. Okay, that's good. So kind kind of um, Escape to the Chateau, if you've ever watched that, meets White Lotus. Mm. So it's kind of um, in that venue. I mean, I may, you know, I may try to get distribution for them. Um, it's you know, for the short film platforms, there's not a lot of. Um, options you know mm-hmm. it's kind of a couple options i think um so anyway that's my thought um to to uh, work with my collaborator uh, lisa bruin the co-writer on the film mm-hmm. um and come up for a pilot which really kind of combines uh you know the characters and, and storyline mm. well that's i mean to me to get into TV right now, I'm developing an, an HBO series, and it's like oh, wow. doing doing uh, feature film is one thing, doing it on an independent level, doing it on a big budget level. I've done all of that, but I'm really kind of new to this uh, to the limited series thing, and it's really it really opens up a lot of of room. You know, you've got so much room to create when you know you're writing ten episodes, hour long right. episodes. It's like right. a whole new world, and I'm like a kid in a candy store. So, ah, oh, that's exciting. Exciting, yeah, Congrats. it is. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Well, very cool, Terry. Thanks so much for coming on today for calling in. I, I'm really looking forward to meeting you again. Or I don't. I'm not sure if we met the first time you were in Idaho. We did. Yeah, we I did. thought so. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought we just did. really briefly. Yeah, yeah and so um, we'll, we'll and I will be there for all the screenings and most of that week. And really look forward to seeing you, Stephen. Fantastic. We'll uh, we'll get a chance to uh, to chat. That would be great. So. <laughs> Thanks again for calling in, and um, I will be seeing you at the festival. Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Ross. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, Stephen. Bye.
All right, up next is a man whose film, which is titled Tomorrow, who will be screening a couple of times, I believe, at Idlewild. It's his debut feature film, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we're very proud that he's chosen to bring it to, uh, to us at Idlewild. So here's Kellen Gibbs. Kellen, how are you, my friend? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, having your movie at the festival. Where are you calling in from today? Burbank, California. Burbank. So I was just in that area. I had meetings at Warner Brothers, and it was <laughs> raining like hell, and I had to make it from Warner's in the valley over to Paramount in Hollywood. And oh, man. it took me, what is that, 12 miles? And it took me almost an hour, like 58 <laughs> minutes from one door to the other. People yes. people in L.A. don't like driving in the, in the rain, that's for sure. No. Not at all. Not at all. I've been anxious to talk about your film because I know some people involved in it. Um, But before we dive in, I'd I'd like you to give my listeners and fellow filmmakers who will be at Idlewild a bit of background on on yourself, your filmmaking career, etc. So tell us how you got started in this crazy indie film world. Uh, There's two different stories. One is how I got started in film, which is the... I, uh, you know, parents bought me a video camera and just the excitement of seeing little, I used to do stop motion animation. So uh-huh. seeing little Legos walk across the screen and being able to make that happen was <laughs> what I needed to kickstart this kind of like uh, ambitious, you know, career goal that right. I wanted, which is to become a director. Right. And then, you know, coming from, uh, I came from Monterey, California, and then I moved out to LA for film school. And then coming to film school is when I think the, the actual career part of it. Started. Where did you go to was, film school? Uh, New York Film, Film oh, Academy. Oh, right, yeah, it's a good school. In it's, Burbank. <laughs> right. It, the, West, the West weird. Coast program, I hear, is better than the East Coast program. The, uh, it is, it's <laughs> because you got you got cameras and you got Hollywood. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was uh, New York Film Academy in 2013. I went there for two years, got my associates, and uh, instead of, you know, staying in school and getting bachelors and masters and kind of continuing that, I just said, I want to go make movies. Right. So I went off and uh, started making some shorts because my thesis short did really good. It was called The Moment I Was Alone, which actually screened at Idlewild back in 2016, I believe. I remember that um, film. Yeah, I'd forgotten all yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, that was that that had a, a successful run. It went uh, played for the Screen Actors Guild and, and went around and it started kind of opening my eyes to, oh, I can make this happen. I can actually make movies and people kind of like them. So. Right. I uh, I continued doing that, um, and then we, you know, we had some kind of goals to get financing for bigger movies, and they fell through, and you went through that whole domino effect that, that happens when you're trying to make movies in Hollywood, mm-hmm. and so we just decided to make a movie ourselves for uh, as much money as we can raise mm-hmm. uh, through our production company, and that was this film, because I had decided, I, I think I'd done enough shorts, I think it was time to do a feature um and and tomorrow is and that that's how tomorrow was born yeah i gotta yeah. tell you i've never made a short film <laughs> no <really? laughs> even my thesis film was a feature i did oh, wow. i did some film school shorts at la film school but um uh yeah just i i, I don't i think i'm too much of a blowhard i could i i couldn't tell a good story in that short a time <laughs> it's a yeah. gift but it's it's, it's also hard. It's great. It's a great starting point, you know, making a short film kind of because I don't know what your thoughts are. I, You know, film school for me was it was a lot of money for something that in hindsight I look at and go, you know, my first two films, I, I, I learned enough on those films to that I didn't really have to spend the money on film school. But then when I look back, I go, you know, just the time I spent in, spent in editing labs and in screenwriting classes. So, yeah, I, the, I'm you know, talking through my hat really, but, but I think, uh, film school is, it's, uh, it's a necessary evil for some people and some people just don't know. I don't regret it. I'm sure you don't either. (laughs) No, I think, I think it had had to do with like coming from a place where I was already, when I was a kid, I was making movies. So when Mm -hmm. I jumped to film school, it was more of like, what tools can they provide me? Uh, what um, what connections can I make? And mm-hmm. how can I utilize that to get my career going? And, and for, for that, they, it worked really well because I was able to get my hands on some very professional equipment mm-hmm. and meet some people that I still work with today and, 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 you know, help me out with, you know, with that journey. So it was, it was less about the, the education. I mean, they were really good with the education, but uh, 
for me, it was like, how can I use this to my advantage getting started in this career, you know? Yeah. You know, connections, that, that's that's absolutely true. That's I have to mm-hmm. say that just coming out of film school, the people that I was able to meet and my mentors in film school and some very well-known totally. directors, you know, really, in hindsight, I go, you know, I probably wouldn't have the career I do right now if it hadn't <laughs> been for film school. So, yeah, you're right. I'll, I'll eat yes. my words. But <laughs> I just, it hasn't been long that long ago I was uh, reading a interview with Tarantino talking about why he never went to film school and why he's yeah. okay without it. And, you know, I guess it works whatever in, in however it's going to work, but who were, totally. who were your principals in tomorrow? The movies got such a great look. So who were your pr- uh, producers and who was the DP on the project? Uh, our, our DP was uh, Martin Anthony Munez. You knows, uh, I pronounced the name wrong. He's got a, he's uh, nominated for a one, aren't you? Isn't he this year? He, he is, yeah, yeah he's nominated yeah, yeah. for best cinematography. Right. Um, and uh, I worked, I've worked with him since uh, I came out here and started doing short films. It, uh-huh. We just kind of click, and it's cool because we have this really good shorthand mm-hmm. uh, where I can kind of just let him do his. Th- I give him references, and then I let him do his thing. I know he's going to make something great, uh-huh. and I can go work with my actors. Um, so, so it's kind of you know, it's nice. It takes the burden off of me a little bit of micromanaging. Um, yeah, yeah he's. It's tough to learn. It's tough to learn that, man. It's, you know, it's it's tough to, (laughs) because when you spend your first, you know, let's say five years of your career doing indie film and you have to wear a million hats, when when you finally get a crew that looks at you and says, hey, go work with the actors, man. We got this handled. You kind of, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. Yeah, totally. Totally. You you don't want (laughs) to. Is it going to be right? Yeah. You don't want to give, you don't want to give up whatever it is that you think you're holding on to. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's great when it finally happens. But, um, and you, who, who produced it with you? Uh, my producer is Donald Nguyen. He uh, he just great guy. It's actually the first film we we worked on together, and I'm uh, sure it won't be the last one. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Talent, talented, talented guy. He's he's uh, produced a lot of stuff beforehand, and he knew we met through a mutual connection, and uh, and we just really enjoyed working together. Yeah, I think I'm still working with a few people that I worked on in my first ever you know, bigger budget feature film. It's um, Mm -hmm. once you find those people, you kind of, I worked with Jack Green once who's um, a Clint Eastwood cinematographer and he was telling me, Oh, yeah. He gets, you know, him and he and Clint are like, he knows what Clint's thinking before Clint knows what he's thinking. (laughs) So (laughs) to get in sync with somebody like that early on is great because then you, you keep working with those people and they help you churn out really good work. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be the, I I feel like a a lot of my work is a a tribute to the the talented people I work with, with, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, Julia, you know, um, some of the actors that have been in this and I, they, I bring them back too, but it's just, they're just so talented and they, they're, you know, they bring they bring a level of uh, craftsmanship to their own, you know, certain part that I like I said before, I can just kind of step back and go, I'm going to let you have fun with this. I'm just going to mm-hmm. watch and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to direct. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, you know. that's another thing people don't realize that I'm I've worked with the same actors sometimes on two or three films. I do know Julia um, Parker, who's in your <laughs> film. I haven't ever worked with her, but I knew, you know, I know her and uh, we've, yeah, yeah. we've done some uh, podcast stuff together, which is kind of cool. But um, yeah, I've never worked with her as an actress, but gotcha. I do the same thing. I've been in uh, West Studi. I've done three movies with and then Wolfgang Bodison from uh, A Few Good Men I've done three movies with him and it's, so it's just like cool. well I know what they bring to the table and it always makes <laughs> me look good so okay let's do that exactly yeah yeah uh, I'm always telling casting directors they'll bring me a bunch of names well this this is I think this is who we should get for this part and I'm well I already have my buddy earmarked for that <laughs> yes. you know? but they're all, once they find out who your buddies are and they're they're really talented people with big resumes then they're pretty pretty okay with that who else is in the who else is in the cast besides julian the the cast is huge so um just to give a little bit about the film it's a story about a young girl who wakes up in a different body every day <clears throat> so you're getting these you're, you're constantly throughout the movie changing the main character the, the actor into oh, wow. you know these different people right um so and like we have I believe it's 56 actors, but we have 19 of them playing the same character throughout wow. the whole movie. That so, is such a great idea, man. That's such yeah, a great thanks. idea. Good for you. That's brilliant. Yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. It was kind of, 
difficult and challenging in its own way when when we were shooting it because I, I know you know this is when you work with an actor on a film you kind of get the actor gets to kind of develop that character with you right. but when you're doing something like this where they're playing parts of a uh, character's arc right. you have to kind of guide that performance and make sure that you're sure. getting the right stuff out of it so yeah. it's it was it was interesting because you have different personalities every week that we would go into shoot we'd have like total almost totally different actors there's maybe one time and a person from the other week would come back so it was like it, it was a very fun experience i don't know if i would shoot a movie like that again uh -huh. but it, it definitely like was what was needed for the film and i and i loved it when when we were doing it it's such a great concept man it's such a good concept it's not let's say it's like a biological groundhog day <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. so um has the film played any or is this a premiere for you or is it played elsewhere besides um you know before idlewild where is it screened so far it did a so it did a private screen uh, a few weeks ago at the New York Film Academy because they they brought me back and they did it for alumni mm -hmm. and that was like the first in person thing that we've done but you know being private it wasn't you know for the for the audiences to come out and watch it mm -hmm. um, it's it got accepted in the Cinequest and actually right. today it's playing it online in Cinequest and through our uh, <laughs> our run at Idlewild. So mm -hmm. Idlewild will probably be the first in, it will be the first in person oh, got uh, public screening. So cool. yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Um, I don't know. I always like to know when, when a film is either a, a U.S. premiere or, a, or a, a, a world premiere or whatever. That's always exciting for me when people yeah. choose us as their first going and uh, you know, they're guinea pigging out on us, which is okay. <laughs> yeah. But, um, totally. Yeah. Just such a, that concept really just, Ta just listening to it is is such a great idea what thank you what's next for tomorrow do you uh you have distribution lined up yet or we're in talks with a few distributors mm -hmm. uh it's just kind of yeah it's been, it's been such a long process getting this movie made and now it's finally getting to the point where we can start moving it into that next phase mm -hmm. and uh and we've been you know we're on a, a marketing campaign for it right now and in in looks for distribution and i think uh we'll probably carry the festival run uh through this year and mm -hmm. in the meantime if we find distribution we'll you know we'll kind of navigate into that and then uh you know and, and but otherwise we'll be kind of screening at festivals and hopefully by the end of the year it'll it'll have a home yeah it's one of those films i don't get to watch most of the movies before the festival i try to see mm -hmm. as many as i can but it's only when my team will call me and say hey you need to look at this because we're not sure what to nominate this for or what do you think but so i'll watch about 10 minutes of the movie and one thing i noticed about tomorrow is watching that first 10 15 minutes it's just really a pretty movie and uh <laughs> yeah it's just it just looks great and uh awesome. so i think distribution is going to be an easy thing for you guys once you get it lined up it's gonna a lot of people will see this movie great concept That's so awesome. <laughs> uh what's the what's your screening schedule at idlewild what days and times are you slotted into so we're playing at the, I believe it's the town hall and on Friday uh -huh. um, at uh, four o'clock. And then on Saturday, we're playing in the rustic at four o'clock. Right. And that's, that's the one that we're really looking forward to, you know, seeing it on the big screen. It's always exciting. Yeah. You know, the rustic theater is so funny because from the outside, it looks kind of tiny. And then people walk uh -huh. in and they go, holy crap, it's way, it goes way back, you know. <laughs> yeah, but totally. it's really, I mean, it's, I'm so proud when I was, uh, that's where I saw my first movie when I was about five years old, I think. I don't know. Oh, but wow, really? Yeah. So it means a lot to me that theater and uh, Gail and Graham, who now own the theater, um, they've, you know, and, uh, Shane Stewart, who had originally owned the theater when I started mm -hmm. the film festival, they put in this amazing sound system and the projection is state of the art. And so, yeah, yeah. even though it's a town of only 3000 people, the theater, the rustic theater is the place to be, man. It's awesome. Great. It's really, yeah, totally. Play. I just totally. like the whole vibe of it and the fact that it's <laughs> 70 years old and, yeah. you know, it's just really cool. So they just redid it, right? Yeah. They've just, they've yeah. been, they work on it all the time and through COVID they did did some stuff but but graham and and uh gail the new owners um they're just all gung-ho for the festival and we're That's really awesome. happy to be partnered up with them they're pretty amazing so yeah sweet well thanks for coming on today kellen um absolutely thanks uh, we, for having me yeah we really look forward to seeing uh you in the film tomorrow at idlewild next week so thank you kellen gibbs thanks we're looking forward to it yeah we'll see you then bye Stephen.
Okie dokie. So next up here, we have um, an amazing director from an amazing film entitled Pretty Doesn't Hurt, which will be at Idlewild um, this coming week. And we're very thrilled to have her and her film with us, ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Rao. Jennifer, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So welcome. happy to be here with you. I know. We had a little glitchiness going on right away. When I was afraid hey. I wouldn't be able to get you on, but you know what? We figured it out. So You figured it out. I you got did. it. I'm, I rule. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from New York City. Nice. Is it, yeah. is it snowy there? It's probably warmer there than it is in Southern I, California. I, I think that it is. I We had a little bit of snow yesterday. It was our first snowfall of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so we do not have what you have. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I mean, it's literally the snowfall here is they, they're saying the most in 35 to 40 years, which I believe it's just nuts. I was in L.A. Wow. In L.A. at my place there all last week and it was raining, raining, raining. And yeah. Um, I just ah get back to Idaho. While there'll be a little snow, but not so bad. And it's literally like I feel wow. like I'm in the Yukon right now. It's crazy. Well, <laughs> I mean, if I'm being honest, I'm I'm bringing my family with me to the festival. I'm bringing uh, my husband and my son. All uh, right, and they're pretty excited about the snow. I have to. Be. <laughs> well, there'll be <laughs> lots of it. My son. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be lots of it for him. It's gonna be it's gonna be warmer, and that snow won't be falling. But there'll be snow everywhere, so it'll be pretty. Right. But the, they managed to keep the roads plowed really well. And um, yeah. And so right. um, before we dive into uh, Pretty Doesn't Hurt, I, I'm starting off these uh, interviews with um, Idlewild selected filmmakers by uh, giving my listeners a little and fellow filmmakers a little background on the directors, sure. uh, the spotlight directors. So um, if you don't mind, give us a few minutes. Just tell us, you know, a little bit of your background and how you got started in uh, in making film. Happy to. It's been a um, it's been a journey. I started as an actor. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be an actor my whole life. I was you know couldn't wait. Um, I went right into it, going to college, studying, and um, and I had a, a lovely career. I got to work in theater, film, and television. I got to work with some incredible people, incredible directors. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was probably about ten or so years ago. I was in kind of a you know kind of a career slump. I wasn't getting the auditions that I wanted. I wasn't mm-hmm. getting the parts that I wanted. I was like, what's next for me? And I, I started to write. Mm-hmm. And I started to write films, which was interesting considering that I had started in theater. I'd been in theater for forever, you know, mm-hmm. growing up and, mm-hmm. and my first years in New York. And I was living in L.A. at the time. I lived in L.A. from um, I lived in L.A. for probably six to eight, six or eight years, I think. Um, and so I'm writing and I'm enjoying that and came back to New York. I decided to move back to New York. I was doing a little bit of acting and sort of just not in love with it anymore. Right. And what what struck me was that I realized that what I really loved and what I had loved from childhood was being a storyteller. Right. And that my my desire for that was expanding. I started teaching acting. I taught a film class at Atlantic Theater Company, which has a wonderful school, and I got to work with some really wonderful actors. And that was what sort of lit the spark for directing right. films. And so then I just started experimenting. I did a few little projects. And right when I sort of said, okay, I'm going to do this, <laughs> the pandemic hit. Mm, right. um, and so so my projects went on hold for a bit, but I still managed to keep them in development. Um, and then we made Pretty Doesn't Hurt. Right. And so this is really, it's not my first film, but it feels like my first film. Right. Because it's my biggest project to date. Um, it is the most expansive screenplay that I, you know, with the many locations mm-hmm. and the four different actors. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, it's my, it feels a bit like a, like a first film. I learned so much. Um, and I also learned that I fell in love not only with storytelling from the point of view of, of directing actors, but also visual storytelling. Right. Um, I love working with cinematographers. Um, so at this point of my career, I felt very drawn to collaboration Mm -hmm. on many fronts, Um, you know, and so it's been a journey from that feeling of when you're an actor, you're collaborating with many people, but you work alone a lot. Sure. You know, and, and I think as I've gotten older, I'm just drawn toward 
working with more people more actively all the time and also generating my own work. It's funny you talk about, you know, um, like let's say DPs. I work with a, a few different DPs, but the one I work mm -hmm. with the most is Trina Van Den Brescia. She's pretty amazing, but she's taught me yeah. more about filmmaking than th three years of film school. You know? <laughs> just, 100%, my, right? My, yeah, my first yeah. film with her, and then I worked with Jack Green, who's um, Clint Eastwood cinematographer, and just followed wow. him around like, you know, like a puppy dog because I it was like I knew there was – there were things to be learned from these people yeah. that, you know, just because they're not the, the director doesn't mean that, that the project isn't theirs and their vision. And oh, also, totally. you were talking totally. about being an actor and then you get the spark to direct. And, you know, when I was making my first big budgeted feature film, um, there were two women, two actors on that film, two, two women who were there on set all the time, even on days they had had off and they were constantly hanging out by the camera and watching the <laughs> gaffers. And they both went on to become director and Cassie J, we, you know, she won at Cannes Independent and she's a, a big time documentary filmmaker. Oh, great. And then of course my friend Leslie Patterson, who was involved yeah. in that movie. And now she's up for, you know, she won a, they were up for 14 BAFTAs and nine Academy Awards. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> I know, she has so. an amazing, that film is amazing. Yeah. But from the beginning, these women were just, they just, you could tell they just had that desire, you know, and um, yeah. they follow me around all day and just say, what are you doing? I go, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to make it through this. <laughs> like you I'm just are, but... trying to get to the next. I'm just yeah. To my day. What do you yeah. Mean? No, I I felt the same way when I was working with people. I I start. You know, I always was great friends with the crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I always kind of enjoyed. Well, I was like, what are they doing? And of course. and you know, it was a little. You know, I, I so I I found it. You know, there's some ways where you feel like, oh, I wish I would have just gone to film school straight out of college and done this with my whole career. But mm -hmm. it also, you know, I learned. I learned so much as an actor and, and I did get exposed to so many great people mm -hmm. in that role. Yeah. And I think that uh, when there are two things, hanging around a set when you're not on and just watching <laughs> makes you a better actor as it makes you a mm -hmm. better director. But also sure. um, when I teach acting, like at the Screen Actors Guild Conservatory and I teach at AFI yeah. and I'm like, you need to edit yourself a couple times. Edit scenes that oh, you're sure. in, and you will learn more about yourself as an actor. I, I mean, I have no, I don't have any real desire to go back to acting. I, I joke around that I retired, and I should have thrown <laughs> myself a retirement party. Right, but um, but. I have done friends some favors for some smaller projects and oh my gosh, it's so much easier to act after you directed so yeah. much easier. Yeah. It, you just, even if it's not easier, it's definitely more, you just have more of a, an idea of who you are yeah. as an artist, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, it's like, I'm not worried about my entrance. I'm not worried about I'm getting out of the scene. I'm like, Oh, well, I'll just, you know, I'm going to find my way out and they'll right, figure it out. <laughs> right. And you see people, you know, directing yourself as an actor. I can't even yeah. imagine. I can't even imagine. Oh, I know. But, I know. That's Tough. Yeah, craziness. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm trying to find out from all the filmmakers if mm -hmm. this is this a premiere for for um your film for Pretty Doesn't Hurt. It is. Hurt. It is. Okay. It is. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm thrilled. I I'm thrilled to premiere it. And I remember when I was starting my journey of figuring out where I wanted to apply for festivals, and I came across your festival and came across your site, and and I I it just. I don't know, it, your site really, the website for your film festival really resonated with me. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, this is what people are talking about. You want to try to find the places that you feel like your film belongs. Right, right. Um, yeah. And it really felt like that. when I. So when I got the acceptance letter, I was just so thrilled and I'm really excited to premiere it. Oh, it's just a great, I mean, that was a, that's a no brainer. So the thing is, I don't get to watch a lot of the films before the festival. We have a committee oh, sure. of people who watch and they get, we have a five star system and in, in okay. all categories. And I just kind of keep an eye on that and look at who's saying what, and your film was just getting across the board, you know, fours and fives. And so wow. I, I went, oh. yeah. so my goal is, I mean, I went on <laughs> and I watched the first like 10 minutes. I just wanted to see what yeah. everybody was talking about. And it's just a, it's such a pretty film and that's one thing about oh. Idaho this year everything's so pretty man it's like, oh really yeah oh, that's cool yeah so <laughs> I want to talk about your cinematographer again just a oh, little sure, bit sure. but but um yeah so I'm I was just checking it out and I was going this is the what we do at Idaho is we like to 
bring on people who have a vision. It's not mm-hmm. about the big budget, um, you know, the, the $10, $20 million budget indie right. film. It's more about, like, I brought in a film a few years ago that everyone had rejected, but I just happened to see it. And it was made by a guy in Kentucky, and it was um, it, it was just so I don't know cheap, and I can tell there was no money and no time, <laughs> right. and the sound wasn't quite there. But his vision as a director right. was there, you know, and he was telling a film from where he where what he knew. He said to right. himself, "I'm going to make this movie based on my what I know, and I know right. these characters, and I know, and it was so." poignant and funny and and you know he's just he just especially when you're you're bringing like not everybody knows the black community in Kentucky but this sure. guy made it so accessible <laughs> and you know, oh, you're wow, just watching yeah. it going yeah. I feel like I know all these characters and so I think um your movie though is you know it's just on a level on a professional level it just looks great you know what you have oh, we, don't, we don't we don't as directors we don't have to tout our own our, to our own <laughs> horn we know what we do well and we know what we do kind of weak you know so, right right and, totally <laughs> but when you see a director like in your film you see somebody who has a sense of what they wanted to the story they wanted to tell you know yeah. but, but yeah. again going back to that is cinematography you're telling the telling the story through the lens rather than mm. just a lot of dialogue is pretty important and it seems like your collaboration with your dp was pretty amazing so tell us about your dp and who is that sure sure oh he's he's wonderful um his name is david siciliano he's mm-hmm. nominated for best cinematography in your award category right, yeah. um and i i he's a dear collaborator to me. He's the first cinematographer I ever worked with. Mm -hmm. He's the one I've worked with the most. He's taught me so much. Um, We worked on, this is the biggest project we've done together. We've done a, we did a few smaller things. Mm -hmm. Um, He also started as an actor way back when. So we have a, we, you know what it is? It's, it's hard to explain. We, I feel like he can read my mind. Right. Yeah. And we have a shared aesthetic that comes from before we knew each other. So we've had a real shorthand with each other when mm-hmm. we work together. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also we have a, a real trust in right. each other. Right. He trusts my vision, I trust his. Um, and he, we, and we have great fun together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just remember the first time I worked with him, it was a teeny tiny project we were working on together and he was running camera, you mm-hmm. know, as many indie, projects will right. happen the of cinematographer course. is a camera operator oh, right. <laughs> and he um which i love when he runs camera because he's mm-hmm. great at it mm-hmm. and it was the end of a scene and the scene the, the script it was tough in the script that it didn't have a button i didn't really know what the button was i had sort of articulated it to him we had talked about what what had to happen in the scene you know i was able to say to him like what we're trying to achieve here is this mm-hmm. this is the story that that we have to get to with this character to move her to the next scene and he just he was he had the camera on her mm-hmm. and she turned her head away and he just went with her. All right. Yeah. And it was like this beautiful, not planned, not in art, you know what I mean? He just did it. And in that moment, I was like, oh, my God, like this guy totally. I was like, he understands me. I understand him. Mm-hmm. He's he's he knows exactly what I'm trying to achieve. And he's on board and he does it. Um, he brings a technical expertise that I don't have Mm -hmm. so he he never talks down to me he always um is very forthcoming with you know the technical information to explain Mm -hmm. to me how to achieve what i want right um and and he just always wants to talk about story you know he always wants to talk about what story we're telling here um and what's the emotional quality of the scene what are we trying to achieve so we did a lot of work together on the script because it's four characters it's it's an ensemble where each person has a full arc mm-hmm. um and so with that you're kind of you're tracking a lot of people for a short right you yeah. know and mm-hmm. so we talked a lot about that and how to how the the ball got passed um storytelling wise through the camera mm-hmm. and you know and, and it was very indie you know we had a great plan for one of the scenes and then i got in the room and i was like could we <laughs> right <laughs> and the whole plan changed and he went with it and mm-hmm. you know I, I appreciate that with my whole heart mm-hmm. we have a good friendship um and he's you know he's taught me we've both learned with each other in the work that we've done together Mm -hmm. how much is said without saying anything on camera 
Well, and that's the trick. And the thing is to get, yeah. you know, that's why I like working with only a couple of DPs who know me well. They know what I'm mm -hmm. thinking even before I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. it. Even if I don't know I'm going to be thinking that. It's <laughs> totally. better, you know, yeah. and then they, they just, a lot of times because cinema, you, you know, you and I as, as writer directors, we've been living with the project since we started the screenplay. It's been in our brain. And then to right. be able to come to somebody who's just now kind of seen it in the last couple right. of months, you know, it's like trying to make the, you know, to get that synchronicity going is it's not always easy to do, but when you, you know, when I was just talking to another director about working with the same people over and over again, and yeah. that's the reason yeah. because you can move faster, but you can always get your vision across because you're you're dealing with like minded souls, you know. And I think that's right. Important. And and one of the one of the beauties with this with this piece is that because I actually didn't write this one, so right. we have a screenwriter who who originated the whole project and right. and really kicked off the whole project, uh, uh -huh. you know. So so part of it too is that you know. I was articulating to him my connection to the piece. He was articulating to me his connection to the piece. And so it was one of the great things in our collaboration was that we were recognizing that this script that Brooke had written mm -hmm. was resonating for different people in a very strong way. You know, uh, right. there was like this commonality through it that really helped, um, you know, us to articulate helped me to articulate the vision as I was noticing all the people on my team and what was resonating for them mm -hmm. in the piece. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's true. It's like, cause I, I mean, I also, you know, I know that feeling of like, I've got this in my head, I've got this vision in my head. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, how is it going to get out of my head and onto the screen? <laughs> right. That's the trick. <laughs> 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 well, how do you actually make this a cohesive story? And, you know, if you don't yeah. have people who are willing to work with you and alongside you, it's not going right, to happen. Right, I find right. it, I find it interesting. Something you said about you retired from acting, but <laughs> you know, the thing is, I mean, you had a big body of work. I mean, you worked on some big shows and I yeah. have friends that have made that transition from actor to director. And, and I've actually pushed some of that, some of them and good friend of mine. She's, uh, she's amazing, but she, uh, she was, it's, her passion for acting was so huge, yet she'd go and she'd direct these indie shorts and the, the vision was brilliant. And I tell her, you uh -huh. need to be behind the camera. Yeah, it's, no, totally. it's not that you're not a good, uh, you know, a competent actor, but you, you really need to be behind the camera. And she, it was tough for her to make that transition. You know, she sure. just didn't want to give up the, I guess the glory. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> no, sure. Yeah. Sure. It makes, it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I loved acting. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. Like mm -hmm. I loved it and I did it for a long time. And I, but you know what, it's also like, I started to have this feeling where, you know, and some of it, you know, I'm watching, for instance, in, in my, in my film and pretty doesn't hurt, mm -hmm. you know, the character of Mindy, I could have played that role or, I could right. have played another, you know, but I love watching these other actors do it. Like, I love it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really wondered when I made the transition, you know, am I going to be jealous? You know, am I going to be standing behind the monitor wishing it was me? And I'm that like, was my next, nah, I'm good. That was my next question. <laughs> that was my next question. How hard was it you for you not to just jump in there and say, I'm, t I'm playing this role? No, I'm like so happy. Listen, uh, I have cried. I have cried enough on screen. And like, <laughs> I have, I have like worked out for the role. And like, oh my God, yeah. memorize the lines. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's also fun, I think. You know, there's so, you know, obviously I, I also really like getting into the the head of the character that I would never get to play. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, your your career was at a your acting career was at a pretty high level. You were at a total pro level <laughs> and it's yeah. it, but you made the switch. It seems like you know what you're doing now and you're competent in and confident in yourself of what you you know, it's like Penny Marshall one time once said, yeah, she, she was so afraid to direct. And then when she did it, she goes, what was I afraid of? This is where I need right. to be. And and right. so, yeah, that's kind of it's interesting. The the actor director thing. <laughs> it's like, yes, a, and. And I know that I could never, though, like there are so many, I have some such respect for people who can write, direct and act mm -hmm. in their, their project. I, I, I can't do it. I can't like say the words that I wrote, mm -hmm. you know, from when I, when it is uh, my scripts, like right. I'm just listening to them in a way that doesn't like make me a good actor. <laughs> 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 and then, and so I've never tried to direct myself. Like I've never acted in something that someone else wrote when I was directing, but I still think. 
I don't know. I like to, I don't know. Mm. I, I like hanging out behind that monitor and with that, with the, you know, with mm. the DP and right. I just like it. You know, Robin, <laughs> Robin Williams once said, once said, decide what you are and be that and it'll be happy. It's a great quote. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, you know what it is? And I'm, I'm really glad that you've asked me. It's really kind of you to have me on and ask me these oh, questions at this moment where right. I'm going to come to your festival just right. because it gives me a, a moment to really like get clear on mm -hmm. some things. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, I, I actually feel at home on the other side. I feel more at home on the other side than I felt when I was standing on set and being the one mm -hmm. on camera. Right. Yeah, it's a, it com I mean, I'm just, I've only, I acted in my thesis film, but it was mostly because the, the character called, was a cowboy who needed to be able to ride, and I'd been riding, oh, so sure. I, I was the one who played it <laughs> because of that, you know, and also yeah. you probably found as an actor, and now you're finding as a, as a director, you're probably finding that you're, you have the lingo in your head. I know how totally. to shoot Westerns. I know what... I know who to steal from. That's what it, you know, I'll, I'll take mm -hmm. these shots from John Ford and Howard Hawks. And <laughs> I just know who to steal from because that's a genre I know well. But right. um, yeah, as a director, I think that's, um, I was reading a John Ford biography one time and he, that was the key. Learn who to steal from and you'll never yeah. go wrong. <laughs> no, it's true. And you know, it's so, so wild is I was, you know, I saw on your, um, on the Instagram for the for the film that the Fablemans is playing in the Rustic right yeah, now, and right. I'm a, I hope you've you've gone to see it. I'm assuming. yeah, I, I saw a screening of so, it at Paramount. When you, you know, or, so amazing, right? Yeah, and yeah. like, I love in that film how he's stealing from himself, right? Yeah. <laughs> With, <laughs> you know, like the shots when the kids are on the bikes and and it's it looks like ET, and then yeah. and then in the car it's Jurassic Park, and I loved it. Yeah, I, loved it. I remember seeing a clip when. Tarantino. I've been talking about Tarantino a lot today. I don't know what it is. He's not my favorite director, but I do like him. But he yes. he won at Cannes in what was it ninety three for Pulp Fiction, and th there were these supposed knowledgeable film critics who were asking him questions at a press conference, and they don't know anything. And he was frustrated because they're film critics and they don't know anything right. about history. And and some <laughs> some critic asked him that's that one scene where it's like steady crank cam walking backwards, and it's just Sam. Jackson and John Travolta talking and then it stops at the door and they continue the scene with the back of their heads and then the camera doesn't follow them and they go off into the distance and they finish the conversation and they're only this big in the frame and that's brilliant and he looked at me and he said yeah it was brilliant also when Trent Francois Truffaut did it in 1953 <laughs> in Spring Flowers <laughs> it's like how do, you, how do you not so yeah it's it's frustrating for me especially like I write at Paramount and I'm in and God bless them I, I, I love them all but I'm in these writing these co collaboratives that I'm in with people who are 20 somethings and 30 somethings yeah. and they're good writers but they just don't have the history and you know they right. they moved us over to the uh to the Valentino building, our office, and I was like jumping for joy because this was Coppola's office when he did Godfather One and Two. Oh, and wow! And they looked at me like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> okay, oh. well, it's kind of sad, but um, yeah. But yeah. anyway, yeah, I just I like the fact that you're so sort of in tune now with who you want to be as a director mm -hmm. already, and do you have a big a big feature project in your brain that you want to get into soon? I have one that's even further than that, which is kind of fun. Yeah. Um, I've had one for a while that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it actually, I started working on it probably 10 years ago. Uh -huh. um, it was a really important film for me right now. The, um, the working title of that is Plan B. Mm -hmm. I, I intend to probably change it because it's, that title has been, has become overused. But um, mm -hmm. it's the most personal thing I've ever written. Um, and it probably is the most personal. I feel like it's the most personal thing I'll ever write. Oh, right. <laughs> it came yeah. from my real life. It came from my real life experience right. of um, when I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to be a mother, mm, if I it. wanted to have a child. Right. And um, and so it's a story of a woman who's uh, creative and she finds herself in a situation where she's seeing a guy and the first time they have sex, the condom breaks and she has to decide, will I uh -huh. take the right. morning after pill or will I roll the dice and see what happens because right. she's of a certain age and she wants to, she's not sure what she wants. She never asked herself the question. So the film takes place over the 72 hours you one has to take uh, that right. pill. Right. And it's about the decision and, and it's the journey. It's like 72 straight hours. Um, mm, that's interesting. You know, obviously jumping around. So, so I do have that. I'm curious, you know, 
I'm curious where this all will take me. You know, it's mm -hmm. been a really crazy couple of years in our world. Right. right. Um, it's been so start and stop. I wasn't used to that. I was always in a go mode, you know, yeah. um, and go forward and keep going and keep pressing. And, and um, so we'll see. I mean, I would love to make it. I'd love to make it with David, my cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about it a bit. It's, you know, it feels, I mean, I thought Pretty Doesn't Hurt was a heavy lift. A feature is a much heavier lift. <laughs> yeah. So I have to, yeah, that's a big Money-wise, biggie. everything, you got to figure all that out. But yeah. I, I do have that in my head. I'd love to, I'd love to see that, that come to fruition. And mm -hmm. I also, I'm also really interested in directing for television. Right, yeah. I'm very curious about that. Um, I do love like the limited series and mm -hmm. um, all of that. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of at a moment where I, I have, I have a vision mm -hmm. and I'm also kind of like, okay and how's that gonna go <laughs> yeah um, you know what where's this journey gonna take me right now i've i'm right now we're in development on a limited series for hbo and i gotta tell you I, it's such a new world for me mm. i've done tv before but it's i don't want to bring it up but i directed some yes. reality tv oh okay. my god i walked away from it af halfway through my contract i said i can't do this anymore Just can't watching, do it anymore watching people implode is not what my mm. life was meant to be but, yeah 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 you know i was gonna ask you um as real quick about uh, sure. coming from an acting perspective, most of your career, do you find now that working with actors, do you think if you hadn't been an actor, that that process would be different for me for you? Do you find that working with actor, actors and bringing them into your story is something that that is uh, more or less a, a no brainer since you've been an actor or? You know, like you said, you do. Do I want to jump in here and do that? I know I could play this right. role. Do you find that right. you have to hold back and not put too much of your input into it and let somebody bring something to the table? How's that? No, sure. I hear. What, I totally hear what you're saying because mm -hmm. it's interesting. You know, I think one of the things I learned as an actor was um, from a, a one of my amazing teachers at Atlantic when I studied there was that it's very hard to get away from the first thing you hear in your head when you read mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. like the line reading that you hear in your head. It's mm -hmm. hard for actors, it's hard for directors, it's hard for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. right. So so that is something that I, I feel like I am super conscious of, of right. like, I may hear it this way or I may, you know, but it's like, it, it don't, you know, you're not necessarily right. Like I always say to people, I reserve the right to be wrong about this. Right, <laughs> that's good. That's <laughs> you know really I mean? good. Like I reserve the right to be wrong I'm going to use that. Let's see. Yeah, please do. Please do. You know, it, it actually makes people feel better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's know, good. It's, That's it's, good. it's a way to kind of like make people go like, oh, okay, you're not trying to be the, you know, I might the boss get, of the I, room. I might even get a t-shirt made. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. Um, but it's like, so, so I think that, um, I think that what I, what I've learned so yeah, I, I'll need, let me take that back for a second. So there would be one way of doing this, right? Coming mm -hmm. from such a, a big, of years and years of an acting background, which would mm -hmm. be, I hear it in my head this way. Mm -hmm. I know I can make you do it this way and I'm going to make you do it this way. Right. Right. Yep. Or you could go, I hear it in my head this way. Why? Okay. I think this is happening in the scene. I think this is the point of view that's going on. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And yeah. then, and so I think what I try to do, what I've learned in the past couple of years, as I've been, you know, moving from acting to directing is that I don't say anything until I hear an actor do something. Ah, uh, got it. That's smart. Because they have done, that's the part that I know is that they have done their work or they haven't done their work. So, um, yeah. you know, and I'm not talking about being in an audition situation. I'm talking about like, you're actually now you've, you've got this person, you guys right. are working together. Right. right? So, so what are you going to do? Let me watch what you do. Mm -hmm. And, um, my dear, I have a dear friend, her name's Maggie Kiley. She's a, we came up together in New York as actors. She's quite a successful director now. And I shadowed her on a project. And what I noticed is that she would take the first cup, the first take mm -hmm. just to look, she didn't even really pay attention to the actor. She would just look at everything that was happening around the actor to make sure mm -hmm. visually it was what they were looking for. And she said, and I asked her about it and she said, you know, they need, they need a minute to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know so it's like give them a minute to get their you know their anxiety out and their you know and, and i understand that i remember that and then then you can start to play then they'll be ready to to play more yeah. um so so i feel like i i don't say anything until i hear what they have to say and then i try to make it a collaborative conversation mm -hmm. um and then we talk about point of view and we talk about you know what am i doing in the scene mm-hmm 
what does the character want? Where does this end up? You know, um, and then just kind of guide them. And then the one thing that I don't do that di some directors do, and, and maybe I'll get there eventually, is I have had directors say to me after a couple of takes, like when I was acting, they would say, you know, okay, now just do it however you want. Mm -hmm. And I would like lock up, like go on lockdown immediately. Uh -huh. Like I was like, what do you mean do it however I want? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what that means. You gotta, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I sort of, for me, like, I feel like I don't ever, There, there's probably nothing wrong with, their, their approach. Mm -hmm. It was probably just me. But because that was happening to me, I'm always reluctant. If I don't have something specific to say, I don't say anything. Yeah, a lot of directors on set will just talk because they want to make sure that everyone knows yeah. they're a director and they're trying to, it's like justifying right. your job, you know, and it, I think sure, it's, sure. I think it's just as important to shut up. What I do, I've worked with, yeah. like, especially with really well-known actors that a lot of times they'll come and they'll like say, well, I'm, I've done this and this, so I'm going to tell you what's what on you. And I just say, look, here's what right. we're going to do. What you're doing isn't wrong. It isn't right. It right. just is what it is. You give me one solid, honest read my way, and then right. we'll do it your way. And then we'll look right. at it. And I found that really works well for me, you know? Yeah. It's um, it's something that a lot of people take time, but then you just figure out where to make up that time later. You know, it's like, you know, it's right. like, how much time are you going to take on this one, you know, mid shot here? But, right. you know, the fact is you you do what you, you know, you can save time other places. You were talking about letting people do, you know, you know, the first right. take, let them just get into it and all that. What I've started doing, and I learned it from Walter Hill, who was one of my early mentors, and he said he tapes or tapes. He actually rolls camera on. I do the same thing. Yep. Yeah, on the, <laughs> rolls camera on every. So they'll say rehearsal yeah. up, but yeah. there is actually the wink with all the crew and they know they're yeah. actually rolling, but they don't tell the actors. And that's worked for me really well. Is Yeah, you know, also, I think it's super effective. Yeah. It's um, good. You know, and if there's what I have found is if there were times where I there was no, you know, if this if it's such a small set or whatever that you can't really mm -hmm. <laughs> they're going to know. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Then I just then I'll just say, like, you know what? I just roll on everything. I roll in rehearsal because you never know. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, you're right. You never know. <laughs> you, I've gotten so many things from that from that role, just the rehearsal role. That totally. it's, I've just stolen stuff. Well, it from is. It. It's it's hard. I mean, acting is really, really hard. Yeah. And. And it's like, it's, it's so, you know, it, it it's so vulnerable mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's hard to let yourself be, even the best sure. people who, you know, we, we look at their performances and we think they must be masters of vulnerability, you mm -hmm. know, it, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and so I don't, I also don't, um, I don't want to like infantilize actors in any way or treat them like children. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's important to know what you're asking of them yeah and and for everyone to know that like right. the crew too you know it's like you know we we got to respect we've got to respect their process the way they respect our process yeah yeah that's true I, I i find you know as a director sometimes i'm watching the crews back so much that i forget about i know that you know i'm 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 so cognizant of the fact that I have to have the back of my crew and I'm always right. seeing if an act, and it's happened before I've had well-known actors who've gone off on crew members and I just I have right. to step in not because I want confrontation but I got you know that right. actor is going to leave in two days and I've still got to work with this crew for another month totally so yep. they have to know that they have a captain who's willing to stick up for them you know I yeah. have to say this Jennifer I could go on with you for a whole episode I know we right might don't do you the... feel like we could just talk <laughs> we, were, we are I'm gonna after the festival I'm gonna bring you on just to do oh. one episode of the fest of the uh, podcast just with you I'd love to do that so, that'd be great it's yeah. a great conversation yeah. I, I really i've enjoyed it too and we'll talk more at the festival of course but i've really I can't enjoyed wait. this yeah what's your screening schedule idlewild what days and times are so you slotted i in? have i have tuesday mm -hmm. i have that first day um i'm in the six to nine slot so i'm not sure exactly what that means with the party and everything that's happening that's at the um, rustic right yeah 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 that's a, usually a good spot because the parties kind of start 
but there but there are a lot of people in the theater on opening night okay. who will come over to the party so yeah okay and i'll be there to introduce that block of films because it's just oh, a great. tradition with me so yeah so that's, that's so good. fun and then i have um i have friday at the rustic from two to four oh, and saturday spot. from two to four and i have so on tuesday i'll be there with my family and then on Friday and Saturday, I have David Siciliano and his wife, who was my first AD on the film. Awesome. They'll be joining us for the weekend, and yeah. as well as Jenny McGuire, who plays Mindy. She's coming. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have some nice representation for the film there. Fantastic. That's great. Um, well, again, I've really enjoyed this. So I want, this is great. I'm gonna Thank bring, you. If you don't mind, I'm going to bring you back. So Happy to do it. But thanks for coming on today. And um uh, I'm just lo really looking forward to seeing you at the festival and having everybody enjoy your film. So Jennifer uh -huh. Rowe, thank you so much for being here and um, I'll talk to you at the thank festival. You. I'm going to give you one. I'm just going to, I'm going to correct you. Stephen. Please. I'm so sorry. So it's, it's Rao. I Rao, know it's so yeah. hard. I have, a, I should have, I was, as an actor, I was always like, I need to change my name. <laughs> no, I it just, it's just, I've written it down three different ways to do reads and oh, okay. I've done it phonetically. And it still you know how work. you can, you know how you can think of it? Yeah like wow uh, there you go so jennifer wow <laughs> jennifer rao is wow perfect yeah there you go <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming on jen thank you for having me Stephen. Uh, talk to you soon thanks. bye bye and there you have it three great films from three incredible indie directors talking about the movies they'll be screening at idlewild next week thanks so much for joining us and Please feel free to share this podcast with your friends as we're growing crazy popular every day and we want to keep that going for sure. So for everyone here at the Savage Podcasting Network, thanks for listening and we will see you next time. We